my dear teachers, with all of you once again. I've had uh, the blessing of being in Colombia for delivering different training sessions twice already. Uh, so I'm really very, very happy to be sharing with all of you today. I know that you are joining us also from other countries. And I think this is one of the blessings we are having these days. We have the capacity through technology to join, to network, to get to know each other, to nurture our skills as teachers of English. Thank you so much as a copy for inviting me to the space. I'm thrilled to be here once again. And I would like to start because today we'll be talking about emotions, we'll be talking about social aspects. We'll be uh, digging into uh, the difference between cognition and emotion and so on. But I think it's always very, very important to start our sessions, to start our classes in the right tone, creating this so very important atmosphere, a safe environment for our kids. So today I wanted to do, because this is something I really like to do, I really like to talk in my sessions and try to kind of uh, replicate as much as possible what we can do in our classes, in our sessions nowadays. We are 100% online due to the circumstances surrounding us. So I want to go through this session with you and I will be, if you allow me, I will be inviting you to join me in different activities, in different questions, in different uh, reflection circles and so on. Because believe that we teachers need to grow our knowledge together to nurture our skills as teachers together and the more we share the more we are together the more we learn and the more our students benefit from what we do so as i was saying i think it's really important for us teachers to start our sessions and our classes in the right tone welcoming our students with an open heart with an open mind and creating this environment that will be conducive to learning experiences that can change our students' lives. So I wanted to do something with you at the very beginning of our session um, so that we can start connecting with this kind of what we call in social and emotional learning essential emotions. Essential emotions are these emotions that helps us lift up, that help us connect to a bigger picture, that helps us connect to the good in the world, the good things that are happening, the good things that are happening in our lives today. So I want to start by inviting you to do together a very short activity based on one of the most important emotions in terms of essential emotions, uplifting emotions, that is gratitude. Gratitude is such a powerful emotion to boost in our sessions, in our classrooms. And it is a very, very useful emotion to our students, again, hack, maybe, in a way, these other difficult emotions that we are going through during these times of pandemic. And in general, in fact, we always go through sadness. Uh, we always go through worrying we always go through different kinds of difficult emotions and this as you very well know my dear teachers it's something that is very present in our sessions uh today as i always say we teachers are native let's say let's say like native social and emotional learning experts because we are teachers we are already experts on emotions yes what we do is intrinsically effective teaching is intrinsically effective so we already know a lot about this my intention today is simply to try to organize some ideas share some that I consider are very relevant today in terms of developing social and emotional learning. Uh, and again, I will help you now to start the session in the right tone, okay? So have a look at this. I've got with me my 
ice cream sticks, as you can see, I've got different colors, right? So I've got my red, I've got orange, I've got blue, I've got here purple, violet, yellow, and green. So I will ask you, first come, first served, in the chat, choose a color. Choose a color right, right now, right away. First come, first served. And I will give you blue one. So I've got Juan Carlos first, I'll go with the blue one, okay? So Juan Carlos, my question for you, and you can share in the chat is, blue, name an object that you are grateful for, Juan Carlos. Name an object in the chat that you are grateful for. And I will pick another one, Gloria, purple. So Gloria for you, purple, name a person that you are grateful for. Remember we are connecting with gratitude, yes? Uh, Daisy, purple, you've got again to name a person that you are thankful for. Marco, green, green for you Marco is name a memory that you are grateful for. If you wish, you can share all in the chat. Yes, uh, I've got red here, yes, red for the ones that have chosen red. It's name a food that you are grateful for. For the ones that have chosen yellow, name a place you are grateful for. And if you are the lucky one that chose orange, you can simply choose whatever you feel grateful for. Four, okay, so it's free for the ones that have chosen orange. So let me see here. I'm reading you in the chat. <laughs> Juan Carlos says, I'm grateful for my laptop because Juan Carlos got the object. Absolutely. Our laptop, our internet connection is like what is connecting us to the world today. <laughs> Very good. My first trip abroad, says Marco. My grandson, excellent. Andrea says, yellow, my place to be grateful for is my beautiful country, Colombia. Yes, Andrea, I love your country. I've only um, been twice there, but I think I will continue visiting you because I love you, you love the community of people. I promise I will go back as soon as possible. <laughs> Carlo is sharing with us, I'm grateful for my family and for being healthy something that in general we take so much for granted these are some of the uh, this is some of the wisdom we've got from this pandemic how many things to take for granted and now we can just value those things through a very very short and simple exercise i want to use realia in my sessions because i think that there is enough technology involved but you could also do this activity at the very beginning of the class or at the end of the class through some kind of technology. In general, for example, I use a lot uh, WordWall, this uh, app and the internet site that you can use for free. And you can just make a roulette with different and spin it off uh, with the different colors instead of using the ice cream sticks that I'm uh, using today. Uh, but I think it's a very good activity to start helping ourselves and our students connect with such a powerful emotion as gratitude. What are we waiting for today? What are the things that we are valuing in our world today? And I think that you will really be surprised at the answers that you would get from your students to these questions. So just an icebreaker to get us all in the right tone. Thank you very much for all of you uh, who are sharing all those beautiful, uh, grateful ideas, grateful feelings and grateful things in the chat. So thank you so much for opening up and sharing. Okay, let's get started. I will start sharing my screen right now so that I can uh, share with you some ideas and some of the uh, research and some of the background knowledge that I prepared for you today. This is a gratitude game. We've just finished with it, yep. Um, so you have the reference for the different colors I was mentioning, so as to have all the information you need. 
And I would like to start now uh, with a little bit of uh, somehow academic background and academic research for the importance of social and emotional learning. And I'm sharing this today um, because still we have to understand what is the relevance, because today we'll be speaking a lot about relevance. What's the relevance of social competencies, of emotional competencies in our world and in our teaching today? What I'm sharing with you, and then if you are interested, uh, you can just send me an email and I will be happy to share the complete piece of research um, about the importance of deep learning. And what is the evidence that so far in terms of how deep learning happens. So after more than 20 years of research across a wide variety of fields, I would say psychology, pedagogy and so on, uh, we've come to the conclusion and we've got evidence to say that we humans, humans are wired for learning. We humans are wired for learning. But it is extremely important for us teachers to create the right environment for it to happen, both in our classrooms, at the institutes we work at, and so on. And what we know so far is that for deep learning to happen, there are three major elements that have to be present in our teaching in our classes. Of course, very important, Cognitive skills, what we've got there in our orange area. Cognitive skills that are, of course, related to critical thinking, problem solving, the way we connect to the world in terms of understanding cognitively what is happening, solving problems, and being able to think critically. Cognitive skills would be like the first part of our pyramid, okay? Cognitive skills, I think, have been uh, widely developed and, and sustainably developed in education, I think, so far through our systems, through our curricula, through the assessment tools that we've got. So I think that so far, in terms of education worldwide, we have developed a good set of skills in terms of helping our students build up these cognitive competencies. But what we need to know is that for deep learning to happen, we also need to develop at the same level as cognitive skills, our emotional competencies, our emotional capacities. That would be the second piece in our pyramid today. What you see right in front of you in blue, all skills have to do with our capacity to recognize our strengths and weaknesses, to recognize and name our emotions, to regulate those emotions, to manage stress, to manage the way we handle and we use emotions for what they are, the most powerful that we've got in our life to achieve whatever we want to achieve. So emotional skills are very important, but they are as important as cognitive and social and interpersonal skills. So now I've got my pyramid with the three different elements that you see on the screen right now. Social interpersonal skills are the ones related to the most important 21st century skills. Collaboration, creativity, working with others, empathy, creating teams that are based on positive relations and creating and developing and sustaining and helping our students have tools to have these positive relationships in their lives. So for deep learning to happen, we need to know that these three different areas, the three ones that make up my pyramid today and the circle that you've got in front of you, cognitive, emotional, and social skills need to be developed at the same level, at the same depth. So my basic, simple, but very complicated idea today is how can we integrate? Integration is going to be one of the key words in our session today. So this is a little bit of a piece of research 
that leads us to think a little bit about this dichotomy that we've heard of so much in our lives and in our teacher lives as well, that the brain is on one hand and the heart is on the other that sometimes they meet, they talk, they discuss, they go hand in hand and they make decisions together. But some other times the brain is on one hand, the heart is on the other. We've learned and we've heard a lot about the different areas of our brains. If, it is, if we are left brained or right brained, related to how we naturally have an inclination towards certain aspects, certain subjects, certain interests. But truth is that nowadays, neuroscience and the latest discoveries in the science of the brain is telling us that in fact, this dichotomy that used to exist between brain, heart, feelings, thoughts, emotional intelligence our intelligence in general eq or iq emotional thoughts, yes uh, is in fact one only aspect what i mean to say is that our feelings our thoughts so our social responses engage with one another to create what we call in general the learning experience. How we feel and how we think are not separate, in fact. Learning happens when we bring ourselves to the learning and the teaching process. That is when we can integrate when we can use both forces, and in fact, the three forces that we cognitive, emotional, and social. So how we feel make us into what we think. Our emotions shape our thinking, and to separate them is to have like a, a, a scientist, reductionist approach. What we know through the latest research in uh, brain science is that they go hand in hand. And in fact, if, you, if we come to think of it, is how the world operates. Out there, we are one human, yes? We are not separate into different parts. And if we come to think of education, it's also been very separatist in its approach, yes? We teach different subjects, and that's okay, what we are specialists at. Uh, but it's been like different silos, very much separated one from the other. Maths, history, English, literature, whatever subjects we teach. And there's been, I think, little space for integration, for bridging all those different pieces of knowledge into understanding the world in a better way. So, of course, for the real person and for the world outside, we are just one. So this is one of the things I wanted to share with you. Another thing, of course, is that we know that we humans are social beings. Our brain is social. That's why we we'll talk about the pro-social brain now. As we are wired, as humans, we are wired for connection and for belonging. That's why emotions and social aspects are so important for us because we really learn something new when there is a reason to share that knowledge socially, when it is meaningful, when it is needed, when whatever we are can create an impact to improve our lives or other people's lives. So the pro-social brain is also now at the center of education in the world. So coming back to this image, of brain and heart, this dichotomy that we used to know about, I think now, and nowadays this says about the brain, more like this painting, this uh, Jackson Pollock style painting. Because when we think about the brain and when we feel about the brain, when we feel our thinking, we are talking about different layers in the same painting, different layers of color, 
different shades of blue, different shades of green, different, uh, you know, brushes of white. And this is really how our brain operates. We now know that there is no right or left brain. Yes, of course, we do have tendencies for skills, others, but all these connections are wired all along our brain, different areas and in different sections. And many of the areas of the brain that we used to believe were only engaged in cognitive thinking, now we know that are all engaged in feeling, in emotions. So when I think about the brain and, that, and this dichotomy of emotions and cognition, I think more of these kind of painting, where everything is integrated with beauty to create something new and all different layers of colors are interwoven to create our thoughts, to create our reality and how we relate to it. So I want to talk a little bit using this image about the essence of effective teaching. Effective teaching is about helping our students connect to a problem that they are interested in solving. So this is something that is different in terms of what we've learned about teaching and education, because what we are saying is that we really need to engage our students in their own learning. How? Through creating a problem that they are interested in solving. And through that problem and through that engagement, we will wake up very moment as this engine that will help them keep motivated to learn whatever we are trying to teach, uh, English or maths or history or whatever it is. So again, emotions make meaning. And I will say this again because it's really powerful. Emotions make us think with meaning. We understand the meaningfulness of the world through how we feel about it. And we engage in learning that we feel is impactful in some way. So we feel and think about things that are relevant to us, for example, with the same brain areas that are activated for survival. That is how important our engagement with the world and with understanding the world is for all of us. It is as important as survival for our brain. So, values, yeah? Why to include values in our teaching? Why to ask these questions to our students? Have a look at this set of questions that we can use to help us and our students explore our values become value explore deep inside what do you care for what kind of relationships do you want to build in your life what do you want your life to be about when do you feel intensely alive if there was no stress what new thing would you start today what new aspect what new hobby would you pick up today all these questions are truths that give us a lot of very useful and great information about our students' worlds and about what they care for. And you'll see why I insist so much on what our students care for and their values in a couple of seconds. This is another exercise that you can use with your students, a pickup of values so that they can see values that they feel represented with they can create their own they've got their space there at the end you can pick yours what are your most your top five values let's say what are the most important aspects that you care for in life what are the things that you consider are meaningful what are the causes are there social causes? Uh, is relationship, efficiency, flexibility, simplicity, autonomy, what are the most important values? Because a value-driven educational system is a motivation-driven educational system. 
but but do we have time for all this and i know the answer to this because i am a teacher as all of you the answer is no we never have time for these kind of things because we are too much involved and worrying a lot about our programs our curricula the tests the exams we have to create uh, hoping with everything that is happening today all the challenges that we are facing as humans and our students are facing as humans as well so my first idea and reflection is we need to slow down our classes especially at this time idea we need to make space human action and i will dare say and this is my own personal opinion that i'm risking here i would say that the human connection today is more important than the contents we have to teach we'll find a way to deal with the contents later but the bridge the human bridge with our students the human connection the affective connection with our students is extremely relevant these days so we need to slow down we need to make space for thinking we need to make space for feeling and the pacing in our classes has has to slow down so as to create what space so as to create space for reflection so as to create space for digesting the so have so as to make space for decision making and so as to make space to connect with what is important and meaningful about what is happening in today's world and in today's life so when we use this time exploring on connecting with awe with curiosity with sense making we are slowing down but creating a meaningful space in our class so the idea is let's slow down a little bit in our classes so as to make space for all these uh, important aspects okay okay my dear ones i will share now because this is a time for us to do our first stop and check very important in our sessions today every now and then we have to stop recap revise a little bit and then move on into what is coming next this is our first stop and check today and we are going to do it involving our bodies okay through a kind of a brain break activity so as to engage ourselves in what is happening in this session so this is a time where if you agree and if you feel comfortable i ask you to turn on your camera and this is our first stop and check for today so this is what i will invite you to do i will say different statements if you think according to what i've shared so far in this first part if you you think that it's true you have to stand up and if not you just stay as you are okay so i will say a couple of things kind of wrapping some of the concepts and ideas that i've shared so far and if you think it's true you will have to stand up okay and if not you just stay where you are so are you ready for this let's see if i can see some of you I see Carlo, I see Claudia, thank you so much. Okay, are you ready for this? This is my first sentence and it says, remember, if you think it's true, if it is false, you don't move, okay? You get there frozen. This is my first statement and it goes like this. How we feel makes us into what we think again how we feel makes us into what we think is it true or false if it is true you have to stand up i will help you a little bit now because this is true okay i'm standing up what i said is 
how we think and how we feel happen together. The way we think is influenced by how we feel. The way we feel is influenced by how we think. Remember, cognition and emotion are together. Okay, so let's sit down again. Number two, let's see. I will not help you now, okay? I will be here. I will not be a nice teacher now. <laughs> so you'll have to do it. Human brain is pro-social. The human brain is pro-social. Is that true or false? Very much. Remember, we humans are social beings. If we want our students to learn, we need to make our teaching relevant in terms of what they can share and how they can change their communities and the world, okay? Number three, the cognitive, emotional, and social aspects should be developed at the same time, but not at the same depth. Remember that I mentioned deep learning? The cognitive, emotional, and social aspects should be developed at the same time, but not the same I love it because Camis is also saying no, and you are, this is false. What I said is they have to be developed, this is tricky, <laughs> they have to be developed at the same time, but at the same depth. And I think this is a missing piece in education. This is what integration in education is about. And I've got another one, affective teaching. Remember affective teaching? Affective teaching is about helping our kids connect to content that they are interested in solving. Affective teaching is helping our kids connect to knowledge, content, that they are interested in solving. Oh, this is interesting. I'm sorry, this was tricky. Nope, nope, nope. The answer is no. <laughs> but I thank you so much for participating in the activity. Thank you so much. Uh, but let, let me just say this. We need to involve them, yes? Affective teaching is about helping our kids connect but not necessarily only to content, but remember to a problem. This is why we should problematize our teaching. We should help them ask questions. Listen, I will share a very, very short, and because I don't want to uh, go away with the time. Um, when I was in secondary school, I was one of the students we all hate, okay? You know those students that nowadays we all hate? I was one of them at secondary school. You know why? Precisely because I was the kind of student that was constantly asking, why do I have to learn this? What's the point of all this? How am I going to use the third conditional when I go out there into life? How is that? me. We all know how the use of conditionals can help us communicate in the world. We know we are teachers. How many times do we share those whys with our students? How many times do we problematize whatever we are trying to teach so that they get involved and they care about it? Okay? Thank you so much, my dears, for bearing up with me in this activity. I will try to go back now to my presentation so that I can continue sharing another idea that is really interesting for me. And this is something that I've learned very recently. Uh, I took a, a very intensive week-long course with Mary Young in Madrid Young. I will share her name later on in the references and so on. And I learned about these new and latest discoveries in brain science and in effective teaching. 
And so what we know, because I have already shared this, is that cognition and emotion are not separate, as you can see in this seesaw. They are part of the same piece of wood, yeah? Cognition and emotion. But there is something in the middle that is precisely what is called the salient work, that is what keeps the balance between the two. This is what tells us in our brain what is relevant about the world, what is salient, yes? What is something that we care about? So the salience network in our brain is the one responsible for balancing the seesaw, for the balance between cognition and emotion. The salient network is the one that focuses on relevance, not on usage. Let me give you an example, an everyday example. I have to buy my groceries, okay? And I have to go to the supermarket to buy my groceries. And I know that I need to buy certain vegetables, certain fruits for the whole week. What kind of vegetables will I choose? If I go in automatic pilot, like my cognition is telling me I need three bananas and I need, I don't know, a kilo of potatoes, whatever it is. It's what my brain, what my cognition is saying. My emotions might be saying, I need to buy a lot of vegetables and fruits because it's healthy food to feed my kids, to feed my girls, okay? That's what my emotional aspect is telling me. But there is another thing because I can choose certain vegetables and certain, for example, organic fruits, because I know, I know that if I buy organic, I'm creating an impact in the world. I am being green, I am cooperating with small producers, and I am taking care of the planet while I buy my bananas. Is it clear what I mean? This is the salience network. This is a salience network telling us, hey, the importance. And it's an importance that goes beyond what you think and what you feel. It's what you consider is important in the world. The salience network is the one responsible for engagement in learning, teach, okay? So it creates relevance and shapes what we are inclined to notice when we learn about something. You know that many times as teachers we say, how is it that our students don't notice that this is important? Because their salient network has not been activated. They cannot see the relevance. They cannot see why this is meaningful for them. So it is through this salience network we learn about what is salient and what is meaningful. My point being, we need to help our students in college. Integration for me, a huge word in education, a huge word. Because when we talk about relevance, relevance is essential nowadays. And you may have noticed that our students are demanding relevance more and more and more often especially with new generations. They really need to understand why whatever we are trying to teach is relevant for them in their worlds, not for us in our worlds. So the way that we use this knowledge builds identity and also a genuine sense of responsibility. We need to build this internal sense of relevance by connecting aspects together by showing an integrated approach to the world. Let me check the time. Okay, second stop. I would like you to share in the chat some words, some words that were important during this second part where I focused on meaning, relevance, the importance of things that are salient for learning. So can you share with me some words, some ideas, maybe something that you wrote down about these aspects, about this salient network? 
I, I was mentioning, and it's important. Let's see. So this is a second stop and check. I want you to wrap up through connecting to meaningful words, meaningful phrases. But hey, great. Students demand relevant topics. And we can spark that relevance as teachers. That's a good news. I remember my chemistry teacher in the secondary school. I hated chemistry. I hated it. And I was all the time telling him, I just cannot see why this is important for me and my life. You know, I just can't see why. And he was one of those teachers that had this beautiful way of showing me how chemistry manifested itself in the wonders of the world. How this chemical process creates the wonders of our earth and our planet. And I was so mindful at his capacity of showing relevance that I started loving chemistry. It happened once in my life, then I gave up. But, okay, so just as an example. Connecting cognition and emotion, sharing, the resilience. Emotions makes us think with meaning. Absolutely. Integration. Integration. Absolutely. Remember that emotion is the engine that will propel whatever you are trying to teach. If you not engage your students emotionally and socially, that's it. They will be learning to pass your test and to pass your exams. And probably they will, but no deep learning, no lifelong learning, no learning for life will be happening there, okay? Good, motivation and so on. Excellent, so let me move on into the last part of my session today. I'd like to mention at this point, um, Mark, Dr. Mark Brackett, Dr. Mark Brackett, um, is one of the most um, renowned experts in the field of emotions and education. He's the founder of the Ruler Approach from the Harvard University. And he talks about the importance of being a more scientist, relating to our emotions in a way that we can give ourselves permission to feel. In fact, this is the name of his book, Permission to Feel, his latest book. And so he invites us to think about our emotional world as a very vast world with different shades, with different colors, and that we really need to accept emotions with their gifts, with their information, even the, especially, I would say, uh, those difficult as an emotional scientist, in contrast with an emotional judge, we see emotions as something that come and go, yes? A healthy emotional environment is precisely one where emotions come and go. They do not stay for long because there is when things get a little bit more complicated. He is urging us to be more curious open about our emotions, to be more granular in our approach to it from a growth mindset perspective. Um, I will not start today with the growth mindset because that will take us like two hours more, but just this approach, I like very much this invitation to be more of an emotional scientist, to be curious about our emotions, to let ourselves feel to give ourselves the permission to connect and be more new about emotions. That's why I prepared an activity today with umbrellas. And I will not tell you how to adapt these activities because you are teachers, we are the most creative beings in the world. So you'll know how to create activities with this. But of course, I also have my umbrella today. I prepared this because I want you to remember and I am triggering your brains and your hearts to remember me as Mary Poppins today. 
<laughs> yes, talking about emotions and the umbrella of emotions. Let me share a little bit more about it. It's very common these days that when you ask our students, when we ask our students, how are you feeling today? Uh, most of them will say, I'm very sad. So the next question is, what does sad mean? Remember this approach of being more granular, of being more specific, of being more of a scientist? Because sadness could be a mix of disappointment, we might feel disillusioned or a little bit regretful, mixed with some pessimism, or we feel best, which is completely different from only sadness. We might feel dismayed also these days. It is not the same to say that we are sad than to say that we are depressed or that we feel is absolutely different. And the way we can regulate these emotions is very much connected to how much we can be specific about how we feel. So my suggestion here with my Mary Pop tile is let's just close up our umbrellas and be more specific, yeah? It's the same as when we ask someone, how are you today? And everyone says, fine. What does that mean? Is it really a fine or is, is it everything okay? So my invitation is to close those umbrellas and be more granular and specific about emotions in the class. You might say that we feel angry. So again, I have my umbrella concept. I feel angry. What does that mean? Frustrated, grumpy, def defensive, irritated. It's not the same. And this key is absolutely uh, essential to emotional awareness, okay? When we can name our emotions, when we can label our emotions, and when we can recognize that there is a whole shade of angry. And what I need to do to move a little bit away from angry, that is emotional regulation, is very connected to how much I can be specific about being angry and anger, okay? So again, the invitation is, Close it up and be specific about what you feel. Same with anxiety, you know, the most common felt emotion in humanity during all this pandemic, anxiety. But what is behind anxiety? Is there stress? Is there this sense of vulnerability we are all going through? Are we confused? Are you nervous? Is it a mix? Are we blending many of these aspects together? And the same, of course, might happen with these essential emotions like happiness. I'm very happy. What does that mean? Are you thankful? Are you feeling content? Very different, yeah, from only feeling happy. Exactly. Then so it takes to be very specific about what we feel because emotional regulation is a two different step. Step number one, recognize emotions. The more specific, the number two, what can you do to feel better? What can you do to move away from anxiety? What can you do to lower the volume down of your fear? So important these days. Because all this is just interfering in our teaching. And it's part of our students' world as it is part of our own world. If we do not incorporate this into the teaching process, our students will not learn whatever we are trying to teach. Because for the brain, there is nothing more important than these emotions, which are in fact survival, survival emotions for the brain. One minute for you to read this beautiful definition by Mary in Mordino Young and Joe from some years ago about effective teaching.
Hey, my dears. We are to the end of our session, and I wanted to share some of these beautiful pictures of the times we could share classroom with students, <laughs> right? This is from last year. This is one of the institutions I was helping uh, implement a social and emotional learning program. And so we were working with this beautiful first and this beautiful story that I am about to share right now. So this is what the teacher did first. We read the story together. Then students had the opportunity to reflect their own emotions. Yes. And they had to draw and they had to open up and they had to answer questions such as, is it okay to cry? Because this story I am about to share with you is about sadness. What happens when we feel sad? How do we relate? How do we bond with this emotion that is so important and that brings so much information? So students, we are engaged in different ways, reflecting on their own worlds and their own perceptions about sadness. So if you allow me right now, uh, these are some more activities that we did related to the story. I would like to share this story with you. With this, when sadness is at your door. So let me read it because I've got the different images for it. This is by Eva Elland and it goes like this. Sometimes sadness arrives unexpectedly. And it is so close to you that you can hardly breathe. Sometimes you realize that even if you want, you cannot let it go. So why not invite it to do some things that you both like? You can go for a walk through the trees. You can listen to their sounds together. Listen to music. Drink hot chocolate together. Maybe sadness doesn't like to stay inside. So sometimes just try to let it out. Sometimes it feels like you've become sadness yourself. If you don't understand each other, just sit together and be quiet for a while. Find something that you both enjoy. I try to hide it, but you will not be able to do it. So maybe sadness only wants to sleep knowing that it is not alone. Maybe all it wants to know is that it is welcome. When you wake up, it might be gone. Don't worry, because today is a new day. So this is this beautiful story about sadness, how our books, the power of literature, can be so, so extremely useful in helping us trigger emotional reflection, social reflection. And it has a lot of elements that are really emotional regulation, embracing, giving you yourself the space and the permission to feel, connecting to these difficult emotions that bring a lot of information and then just letting them go. So just an example on how the power of literature can help us with this. And just to finish, um, this quote that, of course, I chose to share it with you in Spanish. That is, enseñar es transferir conocimiento, sino crear las posibilidades para su producción o construcción. Quien enseña, aprende al enseñar, y quien enseña, aprende a aprender.
by the man Noli Paulo Freire. So I think that we are coming to the end. Oh yes, right on time. Um, I had this surprise for you. It's a small gift. Uh, unfortunately, the QR code is not working for my surprise. I'm sorry. I just checked it when we started our uh, session today and I noticed that it's broken, so it's not working. But I have a surprise for you. I would like to give you a gift because we haven't got enough time. So you can send me an email and I will be happy to share some activities, some extra activities that I have developed uh, based on mindfulness techniques that you can use with your students for different ages. So you can feel uh, free to email me so that I can share this with you because the QR is not working, okay? It's a, it's a broken code. So I think this is the time for questions now, okay? So Jair, what do you think? Have you got questions for me? I will open the chat also so that I can read you. No, no actually, I haven't. I haven't received any any emails, any questions so far here in the chat. Uh, only comments. You know that there were various comments. The only question was like how they can get the webinar record. <laughs> so the the video of the webinar. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, the other ones were just like uh, comments. Of course, they were. Um, like um, commenting on what you were presenting. Basically, they were agreeing okay. on on the information you were sharing with us. So, okay. um, so maybe there are some questions now. I guess and so. Maybe someone might jump into the mic to share the. the I their think so. Whatever they need. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, team. Yes. Hello. Thanks. Hi, Camille. Thank you for this fruitful and informative session. We really enjoy that, and we like it. Really, emotion is very crucial and very important. It gives meaning to life and thinking and all our activities. We must be emotional in all our activities. Please write the email of Monica on the chat box for us to take it to copy and to send you emails to have our gift. You've, yes, and it's just, right there right now on the screen. You've got there also my email address, okay? But right. I will type it so that you all have it, okay? Chat box, chat box to copy it. Okay. Please copyable thank you thank you Camis. thank you so much thank you very much juan carlos you raise your hand uh, yes uh, <laughs> thank you thank you monica for the presentation thank you again for a wonderful presentation that you're doing there with the copy um well, no, I just wanted to share something that 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 you're talking about emotions. It's this um, this week I have something like like I had to do like a change in my mindset. I was applying for a, a virtual job and I have to do a demo class with Korean kids, and mm -hmm. I have forgotten that they are kind of serious, right? You know, there is like a children, a very serious culture. So of course, at the beginning I was kind of serious, but and and then I realized that I have like to like to change uh, the way that I was doing the class. So I had to smile a little bit, a bit more, and move a bit more. And they changed the class absolutely. It, it was better. Oh. So now that you're talking that about that is is that to keep in mind that that sometimes um, emotions are. I mean, there's as you said, have like a very strong cultural background. And and you need to learn to identify those those things the, during the class. I mean, or before, right? Because I, I mean, I I just didn't know that they were Korean guys. So I know that they are a very serious culture. So um, and I had to do like those to change, as you said, those those uh, mindset, right? Like become more open and to show them. You see, to engage them in the class, and 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 that was nice. That was nice. Now that that Juan you Carlos, mentioned, thank you for some, sharing. Because yeah. it's uh, what you're saying, it's extremely important from the perspective that uh, social and emotional learning is only developed in our classroom through our own attitude as teachers. We teachers need to learn more about this. We need to cultivate and nurture our knowledge about how to develop social and emotional learning through that happens in the classroom. So we create 
this environment uh, that is conducive to openness and respect, yes, for emotions. But it is through us teachers, as, as the, the example that you shared with us, that you had this mood, let's say, in your class. But when you changed the approach, the whole mindset of the class changed. And that is the importance and that is our gift as teachers. We create these environments in our classes. So it is essential that we as teachers cultivate these aspects in our classrooms. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a question here. Um, how can we work emotions with adults? Sometimes they are a little bit close. With, sorry, I missed the word. With adults. Ah, okay, all right. First of all, there is something that we always need to take into account. Speaking about our emotions is always an invitation, okay? And it doesn't matter we are talking about young kids, adolescents or adults. It is always an invitation, yes? And I think it is extremely important, again, to mention something that, of course, we take for granted as educators, that is the safe environment. Uh, mm. that our classes should be, yeah? Our classes should be naturally safe environments. But I think that we have to reinforce those ideas through our action. What do I mean by this? When we create an environment of respect, when we can create an environment of appreciating and embracing diversity, working with diversity in all its aspects and in all its shades through respect is that our students will feel more or less comfortable sharing about their emotions and their feelings. And another thing that it's, uh, I think, especially at these times, very relevant is that we are all going through many similar emotions these days. We are all part by anxiety, by fear, because what we are living is a world crisis, a global crisis, and the fear is real. So I think that we can create through this invitation to reflect about our emotions, and it does not need to be explicit, okay? Besides being, number one, always an invitation, you can also ask your students, if you are teaching through Zoom, for example, or if you're teaching through, I don't know, meets or whatever it is, they can share privately through the chat. That is something that in face-to-face -face classes, it could never happen. So this is another way they could share, but privately with you through their comments. And they could just write down ideas if they don't feel comfortable speaking up and All sharing right. openly with others. So there are different ways in which this can be done, but the environment is absolutely crucial to highlight it and to nurture it in our sessions. All right, here we have the last question. Um, it's what authors would you suggest to read in order for us to be able to learn more about this topic? Okay, I was mentioning and I was some of them through the presentation. Uh, Indino Young, Medicating More Dino Young is the one that I mentioned a couple of times. Then I also mentioned an old friend, Mark Brackett, this book that is uh, Permission to Feel. And another one I would recommend is Susan David. I think that those are, those are the ones that I've been lately researching about. And, and, and learning from them as well. So I think those are good references for these topics nowadays. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you for these answers. You also have the answers in the, in the chat uh, so that you can actually look at uh, how those names are spelled out. Uh, well, thank you very much for your ideas. Very good comments here in the chat about your presentation. Of course, that is something that we do need to bear in mind. And as you also highlighted it, um, especially in these days, uh, we should not focus only on, on, on how much students are learning, but also how is it that we're approaching them? Um, how is it that we're talking to them? 
So this is absolutely important. Thank you, Monica, for sharing uh, your experience and expertise with us. And um, well, hopefully we can get to see us again <laughs> face to face. Oh, hopefully, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Sooner and, rather than later. Thank yes. you so much. It's been a pleasure for me to share with all of you. No problem. Thank you. And thank once you again, so thank you all for coming again to this uh, weekly meeting. Um, next Thursday, again at five in the afternoon, uh, same um, space for the webinar uh, sponsored by Asocopy. And as usual, I am not going to tell you who the next presenter is. Um, but uh, if you want to know, just go to our website and browse the information there. Also, um, there is the possibility for you to see not only this, but the previous webinars in the YouTube channel of Asocopy. So thank you very much. Um, just a, a, a quick piece of information. Our next uh, week presenter was part of today's uh, presentation. <laughs> so thank you very much. Have a great night and a good weekend. Please take good care.